Unmet childhood needs contaminate the school-aged child's desire for competence and industry and block the adolescent's search for a conscious identity. It is here we begin acting out the effects of growing up in an unhealthy family. In this episode, we'll explore past abuse in the context of a fairy tale and gather together all parts of our lost childhood selves for the best homecoming ever. Welcome to the show. Hope everybody's in good shape today because we're going to talk about the school age. A lot of people have a lot of pain coming from school age and from adolescence. Uh, these are the first, well, school is the first place we really start leaving home and we go into a new environment where we enter another kind of system. Uh, it can be a very dysfunctional system. And my own belief is that a lot of the schooling that I had was in a dysfunctional system, uh, a very shaming system, a system that had uh, very strong measures of your okayness and whether you measured up. Remember, shame is the feeling that I don't measure up. So we want to look at that. We want to look at the school age. We want to see it as the last developmental stage of childhood. Now. I want to I want to review uh, the stages of childhood. Uh, this is a, a something that I've adapted from the work of Barry and Janae Weinhold. They talk about codependence as the stage of infancy, and that really is an accurate way to describe it. An infant is codependent. That is, w when when we looked at infancy, getting your infancy needs met, what we saw was that. It was dependent on looking up into that face and being accepted with unconditional positive regard. So a uh, healthy dependency. And there is such a thing as healthy dependency, that we can be dependent. Your healthy shame lets you know that you, you, can, you can get help. You need help sometimes. There's nobody alive that doesn't need help. The toddler stage was a counter-dependency stage. So what we looked at there is separating. No, I won't. It's mine. The beginning of boundaries. And uh, according to Erickson, the developmental task was autonomy versus shame and doubt. Trust versus mistrust. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. And the versus doesn't mean either or. It means balance. It's good to know not, uh, what you shouldn't trust. Some of us are too gullible. Uh, so, so you need to trust, but you also know what not to trust. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. That is, it's good to have a healthy sense of shame, which is your limits. That's a boundary. Independence, that was what we looked at in, uh, or earlier. We looked at that in the school, the preschool child. Independence, uh, beginning to separate and form an identity and a sexual identity. So as we move into the school age, and, and that developmental polarity is initiative versus conscience, a sense of guilt. There is a healthy sense of guilt, which lets you know that you can do wrong. Now, as a child moves out of these three stages, they move into an interdependent stage where you begin to cooperate, you play games, you have a peer group. So, so let's look at our index of suspicion to see how you did in terms of this stage, this interdependent stage. You feel uncomfortable in social situations. So, so school age is a time when you're learning to be with your peers, you're learning to adapt, uh, you're learning to cooperate, you're learning to play games, you're learning about competition, you're learning about social, social things as a child goes to school. So uh, 
take a look at that. This is, this is an index. Did you get your school aid needs met? Are you excessively competitive? You got to win at any cost. And boy, if you don't win, there's something terrible uh, in, about you. Uh, you either give in so, so you don't have any competitive spirit. You either give in or you have to have things your way. Or you won't play if you can't have things your way. See, this is a cooperative stage where, where you're working on interdependence and sharing. Uh, you have intense fears of making a mistake. Uh, what is the need? The need is to go to school and to learn but to also know that it's okay to make a mistake. You don't have to be perfect. Like another, another index of suspicion would be you don't try anything unless you really know that you're going to get it perfectly. So you wouldn't start anything unless you thought you could be successful in it. Uh, that's a very dominant thing that will come from the school age. Uh, you're deficient in basic life skills. I can't tell you the number of people that I counseled over the years who were hiding the fact that they couldn't write or they couldn't read. Uh, salesmen whose jobs depended on their being able to read. You know, living with this continual shame. Uh, you feel ugly and inferior. You feel ugly and inferior. You have a lot of social shame. Like right now, if I go into a very uh, sort of ritzy place, uh, there's a part of me that feels like I don't belong there. It's like what I call social shame. I grew up very poor. Uh, we certainly, you know, we didn't have a car. We never had a car. I used to be so ashamed of that growing up that we'd go to church on Sunday and we didn't have a car. And I lived in a neighborhood where there were guys that had cars in the seventh grade. Uh, it was right on the outskirts of a very wealthy neighborhood. Now, when a child goes to school, they start learning about this stuff very early on. You start learning some new things. You start, you know, your family system may have been terrible, but there's another whole system they're going to learn about. Not just the school system, but there's a social, cultural system. For example, you learn about the color of your skin. And you learn that that, that, ha that makes some differences in certain places in society. You learn about rich and poor. And you learn that some people have a lot and some people don't have a lot. Uh, you learn about cultural issues. If you're Jewish, you'll learn about the prejudice about Jewish people. Uh, there, there's a fantastic kind of impact that happens when we leave home to go to school. This is what I call the first leaving of home, because adolescence is going to be the second leaving of home. But there's a lot that we need to learn during this time. You see, we, we've, we've gotten a basic trust of the world, hopefully in infancy. We've learned a certain sense of separation in toddlerhood. We've explored our sexual uh, identity and our identity uh, in preschool. Now we need to learn life skills. Now, I believe that, that you know, it's getting better, but that our school systems really don't prepare us for what we do in life. Most of what I'm doing right now, I've taught myself. Uh, it is not something I learned in school. Now, certainly I learned how to read, and I learned how to write, and I learned some skills that helped me to learn to do what I'm doing now. But a lot of the information that I'm giving you is stuff that I've been fascinated by and I've studied on my own, sort of incidental learning. That is, when I learn the best is incidentally. That is, when I'm really interested in it, that's when I really learn. I'll, I'll go and exhaust something. And there were things that I learned that were just, uh, you know, I've, for example, geometry. I took several years of geometry. I, I almost never geomet. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wished I could have all that time back. <laughs> and Latin, oh my God, I took so much Latin. And about all I can do is sort of work it into conversation occasionally by giving the etymology of a word or something. Uh, but man, all those years of Latin and solid geometry. Uh, so, so there was a lot that went on in school. I mean, think of, think of what happened when you brought a baby home, if you're a mom or a dad. Uh, how, could you be prepared for that? I, I don't care how many books you've read. Now, suppose there was this home ec class where they gave you this little bundle, and they said, this is a baby. You've got to take care of it. 
or you had to go live with a family where there was a new baby. That would have really given you a lot of life skills. See, so school age is a time when supposedly we're getting skills for life. And for a lot of us, our schooling did teach us some things, but it didn't teach us a lot of things. And I believe, personally, that a whole lot of school is a waste of time, at least the way we have it. Now, I believe we could, we could really use that time in some very effective ways. I believe that the school system has been, at least traditionally, the most shaming place. The person with the dunce cap, or you can imagine somebody up at the board, the blackboard, and, and uh, can't do the problem, and going back to their seat, while someone, all the hands are up in the room, you know, and you go back to your seat being humiliated. There's a lot better ways we could do it. And, and it is happening, it is changing. But these, these are needs. Children basically are curious. They need an environment that is safe enough for them to learn. And my belief is the best environments for children would be uh, uh, vertical kinds of environments, like, like Montessori-type environments, where you go in and there's all kinds of interesting things, and you go to your level. You go to your own level. Because you see, schools and prisons are the only place in the world where time is more important than the job to be done. If we all head out for Los Angeles tonight and you get there two hours ahead of me, I don't fail Los Angeles. <laughs> but if we all start studying geometry right now and in nine months I don't know it as well as you or I don't know it at all, I fail geometry. So time is more important than the job to be done. And one of the things that a lot of your wounded inner kids are carrying is that we know children don't mature at the same level. That, that is, operationally, developmentally, all, all seven-year-olds are not on the same level of maturation. So you could have three seven-year-olds who are in very different states of development, yet they're all in the same grade. So that wounded inner child in you may have been wounded but simply because you weren't at a same level of maturation. And nobody knows why that, that goes that way. It just goes that way. Some people, you know, grow taller faster than others. I've seen people who did poorly in high school. I've taught in high school. I've taught in college. Who, when they got to college, they just soared. It's like some, something caught up. So there's a lot of issues around schooling. And what happens if you don't get your needs met in school? What kind of growth disorders? How can your child, you know, what, what, what kind of wounds would your child be carrying? Uh, one of the wounds is that maybe you're a human doing. That what you learned was that achievement was the only thing that mattered. Uh, that's the way I was wounded. It was like I became a human doing. I came to believe that unless I was achieving, that, that I didn't matter. Now, someone else may be a dropout. Just, just have thrown in the towel, given up on it. The grading system was too painful, it was too shaming, or you were not at the same maturational level and you failed a year and you got put back and you've always felt ashamed about that. Or maybe you really got shamed because you were black or because you were brown or because you were Jewish or because you were gay. You got shamed in school. There's a cruelty that can go on. There, there, there may be nothing as cruel as a peer group in school to hurt another person because kids learn this at home and then they jump on somebody. So some of the kids in you, your inner kids, may have a lot of woundedness that you're carrying from the school years. And it's very, very important to embrace that child, that school-age child, and to give them the kind of affirmations that they needed to hear. See, an an another thing that happens to a lot of us, a lot of us have wounds like this. You got in trouble at school. You went home. Now, home, what does home mean? Home's a place where you, you're protected, and it's warm, and it's nurturing, and it's loving. And you go, oh, wow, boy, I got home. Woo. Uh-huh, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs> what happened is you got it worse when you got home. You got it worse when you got home. Your worst enemy wouldn't have done what happened to you when you came home. This wasn't a warm, loving place where, where they welcomed you home and said, you know, at least listen to your side of it. 
Now, also, a lot of kids suffer a lot of social shame, like they had to wear knickers. They had to wear hand-me-downs. The other kids were dressed a certain way, and you weren't, and you were teased for it. You were laughed at for it. Or you were, you, you were very emotional, and you cried, and you got shamed at school. So there's a lot of pain, a whole lot of pain that kids carry uh, from the school years. And, uh, or if there were bullies in your class, or you didn't happen to be pretty, or you didn't happen to be, you know, and the kids called you nerd, or you were overweight, man, is there pain from this stage of, of a lot of people's life. And there's a wounded little child in there. Do you remember what we're talking about in these programs? That when you don't get your needs met, this is called the epigenetic principle, you move on to the next stage, but with that woundedness, with that woundedness. So it's like there's a hole in your soul, there's a hole in your psyche. But I move on to the next stage, but I don't have what I should have had back there. And, and this, is, this is the problem of the wounded inner child. This is why a lot of us grow up to become adults, but we're still children. Because this child in us is needy. This child in us never got his or her needs met. See, I, I call this, this whole series homecoming. I, I call it homecoming because uh, a lot of us didn't feel at home anywhere. The way we felt was not okay. What we needed was not okay. What we wanted was not okay. We talked too loud. We talked too much. We, we were too rambunctious. We were too noisy. We were too needy. We, were, we had too many wants. Or you went to school and they shamed you at school. So, so here's the kinds of affirmations that the, the school-age child needs. And I'll, I'll just read them for you and you think about them. That it's okay to learn things your own way. That, that what every human being has is this life spark. We're all utterly unique. We talked in the program and I talked about Milton Erickson. We're as different as thumbprints. No two people understand the same sentence the same way. Some of the greatest artists have been dropouts. They just couldn't fit into this conforming, rigid kind of system. Uh, we needed to hear that I like watching you grow. I like watching you learn. I'll, I'll prepare an environment where you can learn, where it'll be safe enough to learn. You know, how can you learn when you've got a raging alcoholic father? are a raging, over-coercive, uh, moralizing, should, ought, must, musting mother uh, so that no matter what you do, it's never good enough. You never measure up. How can you have the security to learn? Carl Rogers and his colleagues did a study of creativity. They, they did this with artists and psychologists, uh, and they found the number one condition for creativity was an environment of safety that people needed to be safe. So I will give you time to learn and explore. I'll stand by you and consider your views. I'll listen to your side of things when there's conflict at school. I'll make it safe for you to share your feelings when you want to. Could you come home and talk about your pain, or did you just get it worse? Or was there just a reenactment where you got beat up I had a woman in one of my groups, she was a, she's a New York therapist, and her father was killed at Dachau, and her mother was there also. Her mother raised her spitting on her and calling her Jewish pig. She shared this in one of the inner child workshops. Her mother reenacted on her what the Nazis did to her. And that's one of the premises that I've been sharing with you throughout this whole series, that when you have this childhood pain and you meet your children in these developmental stages, that inner child in you is angry and will reenact as an offender or as a victim. You let your children, you, want, you know, you let your children be the boss. You'll go either way. So we've got to heal this wounded inner child. Now, I've been giving you a number of kinds of exercises that we use in the seminar that I do, and many people are doing this kind of work now. Uh, one of the exercises, all of the exercises are ways to try to access the energy of that particular developmental stage or the childhood developmental stage, especially the first three stages, because that's when you were magical, non-logical, egocentric, 
where you, you would interpret the death of a parent as personal rejection. Now, beginning at about six or seven, there is a mental jump. Kids get logical. Kids get logical. Uh, but there's still, it's still a form of felt thought. I mean, it's not pure abstract logic. It's stuff like David had 300 wives and 200 porcupines. Uh, or our Father who art in heaven, Harold be thy name. Lead us not into temptation. Uh, it's sort of literalist. So one of the things I have people do, we've seen, we've seen age regressions in past programs. One of the things I have people do is write fairy tales. And, and you know in my books that I have fairy tales. I, I have the story of a tender elf, Johnny who was born in this Snamu family. See, all tender elves have to go into a Snamu family in their lifetime. That's human spelled backwards. Uh, and, and they have to tell the secrets of the elves. And Johnny's mother was a beautiful princess, and his daddy was a handsome prince, but his daddy had this wicked witch on his shoulder named Harriet. And his mother had this neon bulb in the top of her forehead that said, do your duty, do your duty, do your duty, do your duty. <laughs> And so Johnny couldn't tell them the secrets because the Snamus are also called the do's. They're human doings instead of human beings. They're into achievement. And so Johnny's father drank this potion and, and ultimately killed himself with it. And when he was 13, Johnny did the same thing in his Snamu body. And he wound up in a state hospital. So I have people write fairy tales like this. Once upon a time, and when he grew up, to help you access the felt thought of the child. And uh, I'm going to show you a clip here in just a minute of a group of people working, reading their fairy tales. And people do amazing fairy tales. It's just incredible. And then when they read those fairy tales, they can connect with the child. Because children love fairy tales. Children think in this felt thought manner. So, so what I'd like you to do now is listen a, a, and look at the monitor as these people read their fairy tale. What we're going to do now is read your fairy tale and have the group experience it. And often the fairy tale will touch the feelings of the child in a way that nothing else will. That's the purpose of it, is to help you access the feelings of the child so that in a non-shaming support group, you have allies, and you're not alone. So let's go ahead and begin. Make a nice little circle. Uh, one of you begin reading it, and the rest of you just be there for them. Just be there and listen. Once upon a time, there was a little star that twinkled and shone and was full of love and life and laughter. She shined and played and twinkled and sparkled up in the heavens. One day, the little star went to earth and was born into a family that had passed fear, anger, and pain down from generation to generation. He was also taught that he was very special, which is to say that all the other kids in the long row of houses were dirtier, dumber, more dishonest, and had parents who were more of the same. Thus, effectively barred from reality, the little boy ventured forth into the real world of other kids. Not unexpectedly, he was considered conceited and a tad undesirable, which he couldn't understand. Reality became threatening to the little boy. When he grew up, he found that he could escape the threats by fleeing into the world of alcohol. This was great fun, especially when he could fool his parents about it all. One wife and five children later, the little boy found it wasn't an escape anymore. Also, his body had grown up, but he hadn't. The church taught Janice to honor your father and mother. She really tried very hard to do that. But it was so hard because her father kept raping her. Janice never even thought of going to her mother, the ostrich, for help. I wonder why not. Still trying to make meaning of things, Janice imagined that when she grew up, she would have a very joyous adulthood to make up for her painful, sad childhood. Imagine her surprise when she finally figured out, after being an adult for a while, that happiness was not a given. Janice, I sense your pain and, and helplessness. 
and I felt very angry. She read through that. I felt a lot of anger. It really took a lot of courage for you to share that. And I just felt real angry and real sad. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Ruth's dad never came. But then one day he did. He visited with lots of toys, which the old lady put up to take care of them. Ruth hoped he would come often, but he didn't. And then one day he never came again. Ruth decided to figure out just how to be so that people would want her to stay. She began to be willing to accept almost anything to avoid abandonment. Her fairy tale dream was ha having her own family, a family who would love her. So you can see that those stories touch a deep place uh, in each person. Barry's story where he's empowered by his, by his parents' abuse, telling him that he's something special. And he expresses it perfectly. He grew up to be a little boy in a grown-up body. Uh, and then Denise's story, where she has the reinforcement from the church that, that the job is to suffer. And here she's in an incest family, which is not uncommon, by the way, in the profiles of incest families, that there are strong religious factors uh, in the background. Uh, so these stories can touch people at a very deep level. And it's the kind of thing that if you're having trouble getting to the feelings, because remember, this is all original pain work. It's all about grief work. We're trying to get to the feelings so that we can express them and finish them so that we can go on with our life. The fairy tale is a way to help you do that. And people have found this very, very effective in touching some of that childhood emotion. Now, I want to show you uh, this chart of regenerative cycles because one of the values of understanding our, our childhood, those four stages that I've talked about, is that these stages get recycled. Pamela Levin wrote a book, Cycles of Power, that I've already mentioned, where she talks about every 13 years. I knew of no clinical data to support that, but I had people start sending me stuff. I had a biologist send me some data that he worked out. And whether this is true or not, it's an interesting way to look at it. See, childhood is a dependency stage, the whole of childhood. Adolescence begins a counter-dependency stage. However, an adolescent is going to go through a healthy kind of codependence with the peer group, a counter-dependence with the family, an independence as he or she establishes identity, and then an interdependence as you fall in love or get into a love relationship. We have independence as people work out relationships, so leave home, early adult. Uh, Freud's famous statement is that the two marks of maturity are Leben and Orbiten, love and work. Love and work. So a sense of loving somebody, being intimate with somebody, and a sense of mastery. Work is a sense of mastery. You become generative. That is, I'm productive with my life, uh, that, I, that I find my personal power. My personal power meaning that I choose my very own life. So this independent stage is an older adult stage. And then interdependence is sort of the achievement uh, of, of caring for life. See, I think every, everybody has what I call an evolutionary vocation, that, that, that there's a point where we begin to care for life, care for our planet, care for our earth, care for the quality of life, and that we, we, we pay our debt back to life. And uh, generally, it takes people a while to get there. That is, you've got to work through a lot of stuff. See, all, all of life, in a sense, is a heroic journey that e each one of us are on. We're going to meet monsters on the way and dragons, and we're going to have to slay them in order to find ourselves. But I, I like this idea. Now, very interesting, in a study that was done right here at Berkeley, Susan Campbell's study called The Couple's Journey, she did a study with a number of, uh, a large sampling, and found that, that couples that had been together 30 years went through codependence, in love, out of your gourd stage, 
when, you know, I, we're going to make it, baby, even though I don't have a job, uh, that stage. I mean, where you're really in, in a, in a trans, trans, sort of a transitional psychosis when you're in love. Uh, I, I mean, it's like you're out of your gourd. Uh, then you get married, you go into counter-dependence. Now it's the Hatfields versus the McCoys. In my family, we open presents on Christmas Eve. We open the fast. We don't save the paper. <laughs> and in her family, you have to watch while everybody opens their presents, save all this crud never to be used again. You have to work out all the sexual rules. You have to work out all the uh, celebrational rules. You have to work out the rules about how to raise kids. It's the Hatfields versus the McCoys. And Susan stuttered it. This took about 10 years to work out. Then people move into independence. I own my own life. I quit blaming my wife for it. Quit blaming your husband for it. Quit blaming your lover for it. I'm responsible for my own life. And then the end of that in her study was about 20 years of co-creation. That is, people began to co-create. That it, it took people 20 years to develop healthy intimacy. But, but, but listen to this. Those are the four stages of childhood. And think of all these indexes that I've been giving you about saying no and asking for what you want and expressing feelings. That, that is the guts of intimacy. So, so think of the situation you're in if you hit this stage or, or you get into a relationship and you're an adult child. And you don't know how to do any of that. You don't have any of those skills because you have all these childhood deficits. So man, is this an important thing for us to understand how the foundation of it all is childhood. Now, a sort of, uh, I just want to focus for one second on adolescence because adolescence is a kind of uh, coming together of all those childhood stages. It's a time of great, it's a time of great kind of vulnerability, a lot of pain in adolescence because that's when you really first start noticing uh, well, the whole sexual thing. There's a kind of sensitivity. So, so I talk about adolescence as the in-between age, so it's the tween age, but it's really the bridge to adulthood, and it's about identity. It's kind of the really establishing of an identity that's based on uh, our childhood foundation. Suppose you hit adolescence and you have never gotten a sense of trust, you have a lot of toxic shame, you have a lot of toxic guilt, and you have inferiority. Now, what kind of an identity is this adolescent going to have? He's going to start developing a negative identity. Like when I hit adolescence, all my shadow side came out. I was this good, wonderful boy that the nuns loved, and I had press in the neighborhood because I was such a good kid. I hit adolescence, man, I found all these guys from broken homes. We were in brothels at 13, uh, drinking. I had, I had alcoholic blackouts by the time I was 15. See, I went into all this negative identity or counter-identity. See, a way to, be a, to have an identity is be different than all these squares. You know, to, to, be, to be a rebel, to, to be reactive. Uh, not to be, uh, you know, I remember we used to sit there and drink and talk about all these funky people, you know, that had jobs and were respectable and uh, all this kind of stuff. Now, toward the end of adolescence, though, I, I'm still a wounded child, so how am I going to find an identity? Well, in my system, I had been a star and a caretaker, so guess what? At 21, I go to be a priest. Here's the way to solve all the problems. Here's a way to solve it all. This is, this is the way that I can establish an identity. But do you see that it isn't really an identity? It's part of this false self, good guy, people-pleasing, caretaking act that I had been in all my life. Because you see, as a child, every child is trying to figure out, how do I matter here? How do I matter in this family? Well, the way I mattered was by being a caretaker. The way I mattered at school was by being the president of every class, and I won medals. And so b by becoming an achiever on graduation night, uh, I, I, I won all these medals, a standing ovation. I was a raving alcoholic at 18. But, but you see, in our culture, we love super achievers. We, we pay performers a lot of money. We, we pay first grade teachers almost nothing. I mean, we have really made a decision about performance. 
millions of dollars for baseball, football players. Here are people who are entrusted with our children, our teachers, and their salaries are barely above minimum wage. So, so, man, or, or, you know, and so I fell into, boy, by becoming a priest, I could be the ultimate star and the ultimate caretaker. This is my growth disorder. See, so I go into this role. I study to be a priest. I'm a celibate monk. A and that, of course, was a way that I could continue <clears throat> my surrogate spouse role. I could marry Holy Mother Church. I could be faithful to the spousal role that I played with my mother by never being with another woman. So nine and a half years of celibacy, which I hope God remembers when I come into my own. I want that chalked up for me. You know, I, I hope they got a ledger up there and they got nine and a half years for Big Johnny. Because that was a long time, folks, and I was very, I was very faithful to my vows. Uh, but do, do you see how I don't, ha I don't have a life? I think I got a life. I'm in black cassock and they all call me father and I'm studying philosophy and I'm still a wounded child. I don't have an identity. There's nothing I've chosen here. This is all a part of this programming. I'm a multi-generational accident out of this whole family system. So adolescence should be a time when you move out of the unconscious of childhood into a conscious experimentation, adolescents are experimenting with ideas, models, role models, trying on styles of life. But, but that's not what it was for me. It was a broken adolescence in which I wound up in this role of a caretaker star, which I lived for 10 years in the monastery and then I became, I left the monastery, I became a counselor. I finally got into my recovery at about 31. I stopped drinking alcohol December the 11th, 1965. About 10 years later into that recovery though, I woke up one day and realized that I was still this people-pleasing, nice guy who was in an act. That I didn't know what I felt still. I didn't know who I was. I do all this stuff. I had this counseling practice where I, I, I had a, a year and a half waiting list. Counsel 80 people a week. And I'd, I'd go home, you'd think, well, wow, all these people want you and all these people think you're great. And, I, and I'd feel suicidal sometimes. Not, 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 not like I really thought about blowing my brains out, but I just like life just isn't worth it. It's like, ugh, what's life all? You know, it's not what any, what, does anything really matter? But see, this was this low-grade chronic depression, dysthemia. Uh, that's the diagnosis we use in the treatment center I run. It, it's, it's this low-grade chronic depression. Because when you're shame-based, you're mourning for your authentic self. When you're shame-based, you're mourning for your authentic self. It's so important that we understand that we've got to do this grief work. We've got to, we've got to heal this child or else we can't have our lives sort of the climax and the culmination of my workshops is a meditation I do, which I call homecoming. I started experimenting with this in about 79 with some clients that I had, and I, I had never seen anything like the power that it had for people. So I'm going to show you about a nine-minute clip of this, and I want you to join in this meditation. Those of you who are at home viewing this, those of you that are here in the audience, if you just close your eyes and let yourself go into this meditation, because it is the reclaiming. It is the meditation that I talk about. Let's go and get the little child and bring them home with us. So if you will, take a few deep breaths, and then let's look at this now. Those of you who are viewing at home, or you, those of you here, you can listen to my voice as I take people through this meditation. Just go back as far as you can remember. Go back to your home, whatever it was for you. It may not have been much of a place for you, but it was the place that you lived. And really take a look at that place. What does it look like? Is it a house? Is it an apartment? Is it an orphanage? Is it a trailer? And as you look at it, realize that we're all connecting here together because 
we've been deprived of the kind of home that we wanted, a little child in us dreamed of. And we have to, we have to grieve that because it's over with. And it's sad. So I want you to see that little child that you once were. Whatever age he appears or she appears, and really look at them. Their eyes, their hair. How precious they are. How precious, how beautiful. How when you see a child like this, you just want to be around them. You can't wait to see them again. Talk to them. Hear the beautiful way they are. Tell them. I'm from your future. I'm your grown-up self. And I've come to take you with me. And you and I will never leave each other. You and I will never leave each other. I will always be with you. And even though you didn't know how we were going to make it, I've survived. I've survived. And even though you feel hopeless sometimes, I have made it. I have survived. And I can take care of you. And I can love you. I can love you like you've never been loved. I can do good things and put structure and boundaries. And you may not understand that right now. But I'll never leave you. And take that child in your arms right now. Take that child in your arms and and let your mother and daddy or whoever it was, stepdaddy or granddaddy, all those people that hurt you, let them come out and stand there. And you hold that child and let the child tell them, I'm giving you back your pain and your shame. I'm giving it back to you now. I will not carry it for you anymore. I'm giving you back your pain. I'm sorry that you have it, but I'm just a little child. And I don't have to carry this for all my life. And I'm saying goodbye to you now because I have to have a life. And so start walking away from there now and hold that precious child in your arms. Hold that precious child in your arms and say goodbye to them. You do not have to take care of them anymore. You do not have to carry their shame anymore. You do not have to do anything but live your own life. You and this precious child. And start walking, keep walking. You can look back and wave if you want to. But see them getting smaller and smaller now as you, as you say goodbye. You have to leave that home. You have to leave their pain. You have to leave that connection with them because that's been killing you. You need to have your own life. You have a right to your own life. So turn the corner now and see them go away. They're gone now. And look out ahead and see all these people that you love and you've connected with. Everybody in the group is waiting for everybody else. Your therapy group, your share group, your church group, whoever. Wherever is a place that you're not shamed. Wherever you can find a place that you're not shamed. See them calling you. Come on. Come on. We're going to make it now. We're going to make it. 
We've got our anger, we've got our sadness, we've got our life back. And feel those people hold you and love you and tell them I'm a powerful person now and I'm going to run my own life. I'm going to run my own life. And if you have that higher power, just let that higher power embrace you. God, as you understand God, your heavenly mother, your heavenly father, whatever that means to you, something greater than anything you've known, that life spark that's in you right now that makes you want to overcome this, that, that allows you to be willing to go through this pain, that life spark that wants life and more life. And just be embraced by that. And then you and the child, just you and the child, be alone. And put her in your heart, put him in your heart. Put them there. As close as your heart beat, they live with you. And they are wanted, and they are loved, and they are welcomed, and they are unique, and there's never been anyone like them. And there never will be again anyone like you. Anyone like you. So take a deep breath. Feel your life now as you breathe it out. Breathe in and feel it as you breathe it out. <sighs> You're separated now. You can create your own family of love and choice. You can have your own relationship with God as you understand God. You can have your own life. Feel that child in your heart. Tell him you love him. Tell him you love him. You will not forget this moment in the weeks and months and days to come. When you breathe in, you'll know that child's there. When you're lonely, when you're tired, when you're hungry, when you've been rejected, when you're scared, when you feel abandoned, talk to the child. Tell her you love her. Tell him you love him. You can protect them. You can be their champion. Now, another deep breath. Be aware that you're here now. You're back here in this room. One, two, three. Open your eyes as you breathe out. So now, take another deep breath. I have people sharing when this is over with. In the workshops, people begin to bond together. If you're at home watching this, hug your husband. Hug your wife, hug your lover, hug your friend, hug your children. Uh, let's connect with each other and do it right here in the audience if you feel like it. Uh, I think that's beautiful. Uh, it just amazes me as we watch people bond together, how this child allows us to bond with each other and how beautiful that that bonding can be. How beautiful that bonding can be. In, in the course of one day in these workshops, we have people who don't know each other when they walk in who are bonding, just bonding together. Because see, the child does elicit love from us. And the child is healing. The child is healing. So what this whole process of reclaiming the inner child is, it's, it's a grief process. We're going back into that frozen energy and we're going through the grief process. That involves shock, shock when you really begin to understand your system. It involves bargaining and minimizing. You know, you might listen to me, oh, Bradshaw, he was really messed up, but you know, uh, my family wasn't that bad. Uh, you know, we had three squares and a roof over our head. And, uh, and yet, you know, if you really look at some of this, stop idealizing. See, you can't, you've got to demythologize your parents. You've got to see them where, where appropriate for the wounded people they were. We don't want to beat up on them. Some of them were sick, very sick people. Some of them were just wounded inner kids. They did the best they knew how to do. It's not about beating up on people. Anger is part of the process. Sadness, hurt, owning that betrayal, remorse, if only. You have to grieve your dreams. 
It's what Carl Jung called the legitimate suffering. He said all neurosis is a substitute for legitimate suffering. All those kinds of contaminations that I talked about uh, in the very first program are forms of cover-ups. They're forms of concealment. Addictions are concealments. Perversions are concealments. Um, acting out destructive behaviors are concealments of this child's pain. And so until we connect with this child, we cannot heal that pain. So this is a forgiveness process. This is a forgiveness process. Homecoming is a forgiveness process. It's not about beating up our parents. It's saying, though, I can't carry your pain. I didn't come into this world to carry your pain. I came into this world to be me. What I do is me. For that, I came. And I'm sorry that you have this pain. I am so sad at workshops when, when a mom and a daughter come up or a dad and a son when I see that my dad, poor dad died of shrunken veins with cigarettes and alcohol, and we never had that, even though we had something together at the end. But it's very, very sad to me. So it's not about beating up on them. Now, some of you have offenders for parents. They're sick people. And I don't mean that you can say they did the best they could. They didn't. They're sick. But, but you've got to free yourself from that bondage to the past because that bondage to the past is killing you. You've got to say goodbye. That moment in the meditation where you see your mom and dad or whoever, and you say goodbye, and you start walking away with that child. I mean, it, it, people just, just feel the pain, and you feel that pull to go back. It's like, they can't make it without me. I, I can't leave them, you see. And, and, the, and that's not, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that they can make it without you. You wouldn't be in the shape you're in if they could. So, 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 but, but it's not about hurting them or it's not about being mean to them. It's, a, it's, about, it's just about having your own life. You came into this world to have your own life. L listen to Alice Miller. Here's, here's a beautiful statement she wrote. Probably I too would have remained trapped by the compulsion to protect the parents and because it is all so pervasive would not have even recognized it as such had I not come in contact with the child within me, who appeared late in my life, waiting to tell me her secret. She approached me very hesitantly, speaking to me in an inarticulate way, but she took me by the hand, and she led me into territory I had been avoiding all my life because it frightened me. Yet I had to go there. I could not keep turning my back, for it was my territory. It was my very own territory. It was the place I had attempted to forget so many years ago, the same place where I'd have, I had abandoned the child that I once was. There she had to stay, alone with her knowledge, waiting until someone would come at last to listen to her and to believe her. Now I was standing at an open door, ill-prepared, filled with all of an adult's fear of the darkness and menace of the past but I could not bring myself to close the door and to leave that child alone again until my death. Instead, I made a decision that was to change my life profoundly, to let the child lead me, to put my trust in this nearly autistic being who had survived the isolation of decades. Isn't that powerful? I, I can tell you unequivocally that I made the same choice, and I hope with all my heart that you will make the same commitment to your inner child. Now, join me next time when I talk about and explain the whole idea of championing this child once you've found him or her. Thank you. Thank you.